in this edition of Detroit Performs. Incredibly gifted photographers head out to explore the autumn woods. A band stays true to its funk roots, and the art of brewing exudes pride in Detroit. It's all ahead in today's episode of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible premiere season of Detroit Performs. It has been such a pleasure giving you an inside look at Detroit artisans, art events, galleries, museums, and more. I hope you learned a little bit more about what this great city of ours has to offer its citizens as well as visitors from around the world. This is something to be proud of. And in fact, to show my pride, I'm gonna take a look back at some of my favorite segments. Now, it was incredibly hard to choose, y'all, but here we go. First up, we meet a group of remarkable people who use camera technology to their advantage. With help from a professional photographer, their pictures create a voice once drained out by society. Here is SK and her crew of Shutterbugs. So we already talked about what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to find alphabets in the trees, like a V. There's a V right there, see? There's a V. So we're going to try and find those, but I also want you to shoot whatever you see that's beautiful in these lovely woods. Yeah. Okay? Cool. Okay. All right. Let's hit it. All right. Mm -hmm. You would be hard pressed to find human beings that embody such kindness to each other and um, such dedication to the craft, it just, uh, and such enthusiasm for what they're doing. Hey, hey. hey I love Frank's this gone pro on me. They're the kindest people I've ever met. Um, they don't have a mean gene. If I find that white movement, the white guy, the white everything. As happy and um, I like art and pictures. How long do you think it took that whole log right there to get covered with that beautiful moss? Her cake calling me for doing this and stuff like that, and they told yes, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll take pictures. So we're looking at colors as well. I have spent so many years watching people who uh, have special challenges be disenfranchised from mainstream, a lot of mainstream things, and it's always been a burning desire for me to be able to be in the business long enough to see them stand side by side with other artists who are recognized and that they would be equally recognized for their contribution. That has n never been less um, than other artists. I think those are bug houses. I don't think they're mushrooms. There's mushrooms on the other side. Patty Sims came into my picture in my world and we decided um, that um, I, I wanted to take people out into the woods on field trips and give them a live experience of what it's like to shoot on location. Kay has such an enormous presence and she directs people well. And so Olivia felt confident and her confidence has grown because of this program. This program is very important because I think many times um, our, our students are off the radar. And um, when we're out in public, they can see um, the talent and the beauty and the love. Well, people with disabilities, they learn uh, really fast. People like me, Olivia, everybody else, we learn really fast in our lives. 
So that's why I like it. You, you learn. It gave all of these amazingly talented, brilliant people a voice. It gave them a voice to speak not necessarily what they could have said with words, but to show people um, where their passion lied in the woods, um, different places. I love it. It's nature and beautiful too. I like it a lot. I just like doing it because it makes me feel normal. Wow, that's, that's powerful. Art is a powerful thing. And it's, it's in our DNA to make art, to be creative. So if that can make someone feel better about themselves, I'm all for it. See this part of it right here? It just deep pressure off me. You know, it's like, it's like um, a gun of grit is falling on you. Once you don't think that this is, you're happy. You have that, that feeling when you're like, oh, I love doing it. You know, and I was saying, I just love it. Look at that leaf, it's so beautiful. Someone has to take a picture of that leaf. That is stunning. They're absolutely brilliant photographers. Um, I'm always surprised at the angles, at what they see that I don't necessarily see. That's the one where I was laying down, like laying in the leaf, and I was looking down. That's the one I like. To see the smiles on their faces when they walk into a gallery and they see their work in, a, in an art gallery, there's, you can't buy that kind of joy. It's beautiful. Every time we do something like this and every time we have an art exhibit, whether it's at the Detroit Artist Market or at the Scarab Club or any other venue we may choose, that when people come and they see, then they know, and when they know, then they believe, and when they believe, they're inspired. Got it? Yeah. Yay! She has learned to express her inner thoughts and her inner feelings by the images that she produces. And it's so much simpler for her to snap a picture than to verbalize what she's feeling internally. These are the kinds of things that change lives. I've watched people who you know, felt like they had very little to contribute who were socially isolated, who started participating in our photography programs and literally just came alive. You can never diminish the value of that. I wonder if we could even count how many different colors we actually see. This is making her happy and it's making all of us happy, including all of our family and friends. They're all involved in it. I love everything about it. We all need to get it and have good. When we are out, it, it gives people a chance to see that, again, we're all from one big family and that the talent and the brilliance and the love that is always shown with, the, with them toward each other, with um, the parents, with everyone who's involved. Oh, the blue jay feather. Oh, wow. the blue jay feather. Oh, the blue jay feather for you. Thank you. Come on. Oh. I see a gratitude a gratitude that they have for the people who work with them. You know, people like Kay, people like the parents who support. Yay! Oh, you got it, great. That's nice it. shot. I want to thank you, Kay, because I like to take pictures. Now next up, a deep funk band that will put the dip back in your hips and the jive in your stride. Here are the Third Coast Kings. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Third Coast Kings. We love the fact that you are here right now. Get ready to get down, because it's been a long week. And now, we are all here together. Don't get it wrong, don't get it twisted. Friday night, let's get lifted. I know you're all standing around, but by the time we're done, I want to see y'all having some D. 
disco fun. I had a few different bands that I had been working on, and um, I guess I sort of realized that there was a certain type of music that I was I was getting closer to, and it's something that was more meaningful to me, and that was funk music. It was it was more like a subgenre of the deep funk, the deep soul, stuff like that, and. Uh, I started looking around on the internet and I, I ended up finding a bass player and uh, my guitar player was Steve who's actually now the bass player. So we put the band together and it was a few different things, um, a few different names. We were the Monarchs, we were Styles Davis. So we eventually settled down on, on the Third Coast Kings which was where we got serious and uh, we decided that this was going to be the thing that you know we would, we would launch to, to the public. Well, I love the feeling of it. I guess, I mean, you could call that the soul of it or the groove or something like that, but I just, I think um, it makes you feel good. It makes you want to move. What this band is as if James Brown during the years 1968 and 1975 had maybe a little bit more jazzy horn sections. The charts are almost a little more slice of bebop and big band jazz. Um, with a drummer that's playing at a little different tempo than the James Brown songs. My direction was um, some of the old school funk stuff, some of the obscure stuff. It's something that's it's got a lot more power to it, it's got a lot of uh, feeling to it, and it's harder to find. So there were a lot of DJs that were digging up these records, you know, looking for this deep funk sound. and. Uh, you know, once I locked into that and started following what they were doing, that's where I discovered our sound. I mean, it came from soul music, it came from Motown, and at the same time, there were so many other bands, the, you know, in the big sea of things, there were all these little fish that were trying to compete for the same sound. And uh, the stuff that we try to recreate are those little fish. It's, you know, track eight, side two of an album they own, but they didn't hear it more than the first time, so it's like, oh, wow. And so I guess a lot of our songs that we write that are ours, um, we try to have that, oh wow, factor. I'm winning so much in this. We're a funk band and we do funk music, you know, we don't dally and a whole lot of other stuff. It's deep funk, you know, and people get it, you know, when they when they hear us. And honestly, as complicated as my life is sometimes, it's, it's, it's nice to be like, this is what it is. It's one thing that we do. You can focus on that. It's all got to have a foundation. It's like a house for us. It's, um, it always starts with me and my bass player. We come up with some grooves. From there, once we have something that we like, we'll record it and then send it off to the horn players and they write on top of that. I just play the rhythm that I know is, uh, is the right sound, it's the right fit, and then uh, I leave the guys to the rest. You know, we interact, you know, it's, all, it's a nice creative process. You know, we'll spend time in the think tank and um, it always works out. You don't see a lot of bands with that many people in them. We've got, you know, guitar, bass, drums, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, two singers, so eight people. I think it's a, it's a simple sound. It's very, you have um, the horns, which have a very specific kind of sound, and then the driving rhythm section. Um, and I think we try to, we really try to make our music as simple as possible and kind of strip down to the style. I think that's where the deep funk comes in, is that it's, it's really supposed to be just about that, that groove at the center of it all. Now imagine. You are in a 1982 Cutlass Supreme. And you are driving down Woodward in Detroit, Michigan.
Well, we are influenced by Detroit Lot. Our, our, our upcoming album, um, you know, we've got some song titles on there about Detroit, West Grand Boulevard, Mayors of Detroit. I mean, the, the heritage of Detroit, the music is, is huge, you know, so it's very inspiring, you know, in that regard, and there's a lot, there's a lot of good funk. What this song is all about. I think musically, Detroit's got an incredibly deep musical history. So, I mean, for me, it's something that's very special to be a part of it in some way and s somehow try to continue that history that's there. Um, I think we have a huge responsibility to try to represent Detroit in the best way we can. In fact, to me, if we say we lived anywhere in Michigan, called ourselves a funk band, and didn't try to play in Detroit, then that's a penalty, that's a personal foul. If you're near Mecca, you go to Mecca. You can go anywhere on this planet and say, we're from Detroit. And people will have to lay down a little bit of respect, whether they've heard you or not. But Detroit has that grit that makes the funk great. Hey, if you wanna get some, you better leave some. If you wanna get some, you better leave some. Music lives on. For us, this kind of music was deeply important. I just want other people to feel that, really. And so if we can play it and some other person will hear it, maybe they don't even know it's funk, but maybe they'll go look up a musician, go, go try to find um, some other music that's like this and keep the, keep the tradition alive. We love you. Good night. And now, here are the events happening this week around Detroit. Now next up is a Detroit brewery which shows how creating something people really enjoy is not only an art, but produces an immense amount of Detroit pride. Art and beer is individual, and that's why there's so many breweries in the, in the state of Michigan, over 110, and, and customers love that too. So each individual brewery has their own story, you know, has their own beers that they make, and uh, that, that's the true art of it, because there isn't one beer that's alike. It's something that people will go out of their way to purchase or to try. Breweries have become um, destinations, travel destinations for people. People will go out of their way to find beer at the source. Yeah, I would compare brewing kind of like being a chef where you have all these different ingredients available and you want to find the right combination to make a beer just the way you want it. And then it's also very rewarding when you make a beer that you like and you find out all these other people like it too. No one started with 100 barrel tanks like, like, like places are moving into now. It all started very small and very, um, again, hands-on is, uh, is the best way to describe it. So you've got your uh, palette of ingredients and you've got your equipment and you're blending it together in, in a unique way to create a unique product. I think it's what separates craft beers from like the huge mega brewers is the fact that the, the mega brewers are just making, you know, very light, plain beer that, you know, appeals to just about anyone. Like, you, it's hard to dislike one of those big beers because there's not a whole lot of flavor to it. And people who like craft beer are looking for something more. So we have different types of grain that we use that make it darker or roastier. Uh, we have different hops. We can add a whole lot of hops, make it hoppier. 
Um, you're more and more getting into like sour beers, like Belgian style beers that are made in the US. So all these different things that have very distinct flavors that aren't for everyone, uh, but they're more of like a, a gourmet product really. We could easily uh, just make vanilla java porter and dirty blonde and, and do nothing else and probably still sometimes struggle with meeting the demand. But as you, you like, everybody likes, as, as an artist and, as, and in that realm, you always like to spread your wings a little bit, a little bit and just and see what else you can do. You want to you test your own limits, test your, the limits of your equipment, and it allows us to have a little bit of fun. Get all these different ingredients you can mix together in different combinations, give you different results, and you can just play with things from there and alter things. You know, you can come up with a, a simple beer and then come up with variations of that beer. I mean, it's you know, it's endless how far you can go with it. Dozens of types of grains and hops and processes you can use, and uh, different strains of yeast, and you have to learn them all and figure out which which of these will give you the flavor that you're looking for so that you can come up with a creation, really, what is what it is, that's unique to your brewery. We really kind of cover all the bases. We have approximately 30, approximately 30 different labels that we produce, whether it be all year round, occasional single batch production, or seasonal, uh, seasonal production. It's nice to make something that people appreciate and people really enjoy. Like when people really like one of our beers, they become big fans of it. It's not just something that's convenient or cheap or they're buying it because they really like it. And we're still doing things where we grab the 50 pound bag of malted barley and we're putting it into the mill to grind it. And you know, it takes at least 17 of those to make a batch, sometimes more. Uh, and we're throwing in the hops right into the pot, just, you know, just by hand, everything's kind of by hand. So uh, it's different than, like I've done tours of some of the huger breweries in this country and you hardly see any people there. You mean, you might see as many people in one of those as you see in one of these small breweries uh, because everything's automated. Here, you know, everything's kind of done by hand, even the bottling part of it, it's loaded and unloaded by hand and I think that's the big difference. I think there's lately a lot of pride in Detroit in the city that's taken a beating over the last few years, but everyone I think is starting to stand up and say this really is a great city, a great old town, and it really gives you, I think it means a lot to people throughout the Detroit area and throughout the state that this is made right in the city of Detroit. One of our slogans is, is we, we're bringing Detroit everywhere and uh, it's showing and uh, the Detroit name does very well. You know, we're gritty, we're resourceful, we're blue collar, we're hard workers, we like to have a great time. So it's, it's very rewarding. I like it when I sit down at the bar at the end of the day or take home a bottle and I, like we just had our blueberry cobbler beer and I took one gulp of that and I knew it was just right on. It was just like dessert in a bottle, so. It's always a satisfying thing, you know, I guess I suppose it's true for whatever you do. If you're working on something and you complete it and you know it's good, it makes you feel good. This is more than just a home brewer. This is something that you can go to any store and people talk to me about beers. People all around Detroit have heard of it and tell me they love the beers and it feels good to, to say, yeah, I made that. We know we've gotten it right when, uh, when we need to make more <laughs> and we can't make enough. I cannot believe how many places I've been to this year. What a creative and exciting metro area we have right here at our fingertips. Get out there and explore, discover, and create for yourself. Let's show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.